good morning viewers and very warm welcome to the ninth episode of the meet the media weapon series today in the episode we have a very eminent film critic filmmaker and a journalist with us he is someone who has won two national awards and is proud alumni of great city of learning iit roorkee before presenting his full introduction may i first welcome the renowned filmmaker and film critic mr uthal bhor pujari to the show uh hello everyone and thank you mr ahmed for uh, making me part of this series uh, it's really an honor thank you so much mr uthal bhor pujari for joining us today in the show uh mr uthal bhor pujari is a national award winning filmmaker and film critic and is a formal former journalist and alumni of iit roorkee his fiction debut and assamese children feature film called issue produced by children film society of india tfs and the first premiere in the indian language competition at the 23rd kolkata international film festival it, it received the best director and the best film nomination in 2017 and followed it up with a special jury award in the indian competition section of the 10th bengaluru international film festival in 2018 and the national film award for the best smes feature film at 65th national film award 2018 film also won several major awards at the assam state film award 2018 prax cine awards assam 2018 and got the best film award at third sialdar barua memorial award assam 2018 the film has traveled to the many international film festivals all across the globe earlier he had won the son kamala for the best film critic at the 58th national film award in 2003 as a filmmaker he made his first documentary film mayong with reality in 2012 which was screened in several film festivals his next documentary songs of the blue hills produced in 2013 by the center for cultural resources and training ccrt which is under the ministry of culture government of india was invited to nearly 20 international film festivals including indian panorama section of the 45th international film festival of india goa in 2014 and also is seen as a part of the world music courts at famous central conservatory of music in beijing china his feature and documentary memoirs of a forgotten war which focuses on world war 2 is a famous battle uh, in northeastern india got its world premiere at the indian panorama section of at of 47th international film festival of india goa 2016 it was widely appreciated his other documentaries for a darbar of the people 2013 which is for the union ministry of panchayat raj and the soccer queen of rani 2014 made for rajya sabha television have also been well appreciated mr bhor pujari has written scripts for several documentaries he has served on several prestigious national and international film juries including as a chairman of the jury for the best writing on cinema at 66th national film award 2019 and as member of mumbai international film festival mif organized by film studies and jury in 2020 and in 2010 as well the indian panorama feature film jury for ep 2014 national award for best writing in 2005 he is also active as the film festival organizer and curator mr bodpura pujari has extensively written on cinema politics society literature and culture amongst other things before turning a script writer and filmmaker So as a professional journalist since 1993 he covered leading political events parliament proceedings central government ministries assembly and lok sabha elections northeast india international film festival and many more currently he is in midst of making a documentary film on the mask art of majuri produced by indira gandhi national center for arts and a short fiction film mr gosh pujari it is such an honor to have you on the show today so so my question my first question to you is you know you had such a fascinating journey uh, from being an antic in applied geology from iit roorkee and then a journalist and becoming a national film award winning film critic and filmmaker so tell us something about that how did it all start uh first of all thank you very much for uh, the co- very comprehensive introduction i mean you have actually uh, said much more than i deserve to be spoken about but thank you uh you know uh, i i come from assam i i, I was born in guwahati and uh, brought up there and i till my graduation i studied in guwahati then i came to iit roorkee uh i mean from childhood itself i used to i had this uh, kind of uh, 
interest in uh, you know writing about uh, subjects that i find interest in such as science uh, about culture about cinema so uh, you know in local newspapers i used to write once in a while uh, in the children column and it started that way actually and that interest was always there so, but i i mean i i i was not writing very frequently just off and on and then when i got into college uh, i started uh, you know uh, writing uh, regularly for a fortnightly magazine called the northeast sun which is which was published from delhi uh, I, i used to write on various aspects of northeast india in that magazine and i also started writing in local newspapers even as a college student so that uh, i think continued till uh, even in iit roorkee where i used to write on various university activities in uh, in 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 newspapers published in delhi and which had uh, sections for educational supplements and also about uh, you know even travel pieces to wherever i used to travel i used to write try and write a piece but uh, i never thought i would become a professional journalist still then so after i uh, did my, my mtech from uh, iit roorkee in 93 then uh, by that time kind of i was very much uh, deeply interested in the profession but you know in our times in the 90s in a place like guwahati there was actually uh, no not much of a guidance to guidance about how to pursue your area of interest so actually while during my educational uh, career i was like just flowing along with the uh, going with the flow basically i was i i got into uh, geology uh, as a subject accidentally if so to say but it's a fascinating subject i found out and then i went to i got a seat in iit roorkee it's a very tough exam examination just you know 25 seats for which uh, hundreds of students from all over india give their entrance exams uh but so but if i had known maybe during my college times about uh, i or uh, institutions like iimc i i might have uh, i mean joined there to learn the basics of journalism but nevertheless uh, since i i thought i had the knack to kind of uh, write about things so after i did my masters i returned to guwahati and i joined a newspaper called the sentinel which is one of the most prestigious newspapers there and of course my uh, family my parents they were uh, kind of quite upset because you know as a geologist you can get a job in a top multinational or even a top uh, organization psu like ongc and get a fat salary whereas <laughs> in a newspaper local newspaper you just get a very small almost like a stipend but i worked there for about one year and then i got a chance to uh, you know give an interview to, uh, uh, with pti in delhi press trust of india and i was lucky to get a job and that was when i shifted to delhi uh, towards the end of 94 and uh, pti actually opened up the world uh, to me you know because being a news agency there is no uh, dearth of space for writing unlike in newspapers so uh, while i was in the desk initially as a sub editor but i used i started writing on various aspects and you know in those days there was no digital media no uh, you know no internet and television media was also in its infancy so print media was really really strong so and pti uh, news used to get carried all over so that used to give me a big kick that one story i do and it comes out in newspapers all across india and in some papers with the byline you know so and coming to delhi uh, it uh, was kind of a big exposure for me because delhi is a big center for art and cultural activities as you you yourself have worked in delhi so you know because i first ifi i covered was in 1996 and then onwards i have been covering ifi then also uh, like india heritage center india international center various cultural centers of the embassies and all they uh, they gave me huge exposure into uh, indian and international culture and cinema so that way i kind of uh, started writing more and more and i got tremendous encouragement encouragement from pti uh, because i used to i used to kind of go and attend events beyond, beyond my duty hours at the desk and so obviously my editors also liked that <laughs> so uh, that when and after Five years in PTI, I joined Deccan Herald in the Delhi bureau of Deccan Herald, which is a very eminent newspaper published from Bangalore. Uh, so there, I used 
uh, for 10 years. I mean, that was still almost till the end of my professional journalist career. I'm I even now I write, but write occasionally, uh, but not as a not not to earn my bread and butter. But because by end of 2010, I kind of thought that okay, enough writing about others now let's do something creative on my own so mm -hmm. i shifted to uh, decided to shift to filmmaking i mean it was a kind of uh, one can say tough decision because uh, you were already uh, into an established career as a journalist but then you again jump into an uncertain future as an independent filmmaker but i thought let me try it out and uh, then i made made this uh, documentary called mayong meets uh, slash reality so that's how the whole thing started, you know, my foray into journalism, uh, into filmmaking. So now it's almost like it'll be 10 years as a filmmaker towards the end of this year. So it has been so far so good, but let's see how it uh, you know, proceeds further. It's indeed a very, very interesting journey. Actually, I'm sure audience would like to know uh, more about, you know, you were already doing, you know, such a, uh, such a important course of Amtech best to in IIT Roorkee actually. So what triggered you, you know, doing doing an MTech from IIT Roorkee, what triggered you to join the journalism basically? See, I always thought that, I mean, I, I was not, like I said, I was, I was, I didn't know that I would become a professional journalist till I was into second year of my MTech. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but I always thought and my, it was uh, in my family also, my parents also uh, uh, always uh, me told, told us children that Education is always very important. So uh, and 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 since I, I was reasonably okay in studies, I I was I got the first class first position in my BSc in uh, with geology honors in Guwahati University. So uh, and and then I got I thought if I have to do a master's degree, if I get uh, a seat in the best of the best institutions, why not? I mean that's how I gave entrance to uh, in IIT Roorkee, which was then known as University of Roorkee. And it has got uh, supposedly one of the best, uh, you know, art sciences departments in the whole country. So when I got the chance to study there, I, I mean, I, I thought that I should not let go of this opportunity. Though I could have kind of joined journalism even after graduation, but uh, uh, I mean, that thought I was still in half a mind. I used to write, but it was not kind of. I was not sure that I would go into professional journalism. So only after I did my MTech and then uh, uh, I, I I was kind of decided that okay that that's where my passion lies. That's how I came into journalism. Mm -hmm. so, so any incident you know which sort of triggered you to you know choose this journalism pro profession? Uh, not a particular incident, but uh, I always used to you know uh, write about. Uh, Know, various aspects of northeast india and, and when we were young we used to see that you know the national media the so called national media which is i believe actually more of a metropolitan media because uh, they really cover the interiors of india in in, in depth unless there is a crisis so uh, as far as northeast is concerned it was always been very scant kind of coverage i mean uh, if you have any news, especially in those days, uh, when you would get a news about Northeast in mainstream national media, it will be mostly about insurgency or about natural calamities like flood, uh, floods, earthquakes and like that. So that was always, uh, you know, at the back of my mind that while well, I mean, there is the Northeast is such a diverse uh, ethnically, culturally and it's such a diverse region. But nothing is known about uh, the region outside. So that was one trigger that uh, I should, uh, uh, you know, join journalism and write more and more about my region. And uh, uh, in those days, of course, there were very few journalists from Northeast India working outside. So that might also have been the have been a reason that the, the, the news about uh, stories about the region were underwritten. But now, of course, the situation has changed very much now uh, in 2020. Now there are hundreds and hundreds of, you know, young people uh, from various parts of Northeast working not uh, in the media houses, not only in Delhi, but across the country. So you see more and more of uh, stories from Northeast now and more a lot of positive stories. True that. So, uh, yeah. yeah, as you said, you, you are basically from Assam, you, you know, then you shifted to Delhi. 
so can you yeah. sort of you know share the challenges uh, which you face you know uh, uh, while you shifted from you know assam to delhi was it difficult to shift to delhi uh yeah sort of because guwahati in those days was a kind of a small town atmosphere you know so that and delhi delhi has always been a big city and you know it's a culturally very diverse and all that so it was very exciting but at the same time bit of challenging because i was coming from a totally different background uh, uh, and to a fresh new kind of environment but uh, my uh, i had stayed for 3 years in rurki so i was kind of uh, you know i i had by then got accustomed to the uh, lifestyle and cultural cultural nuances of north india sure. and also linguistically i was okay in hindi by then so mm -hmm. that was not much of a problem uh, the only problem initially was of you know uh, food because having when you shift to a new place as a bachelor as a young person to a new city and you don't like to cook you often eat outside and uh, so so the initial years it was a lot of you know stomach issues uh, for the first uh, at least one year or so uh, to get adjusted to the food habits and of, then of course now it has been like from 95 to it has been 25 years now in delhi so now i am like uh, you can say at least half at least half a delhi right now delhi yeah <laughs> very well yeah. said Uh, so yeah. you know the beginning of your career uh, was basically uh, journalism basically so can you recall right, right. some of your writings you know can you can you recall some of your writing on various aspects of northeast vis-a-vis uh, -vis coverage of northeast in national media than in maybe 90s and now right so uh, when i started as a professional journalist i like i said i used to regularly write uh, even as a college student in guwahati in, in publications like northeast sun and in in local newspapers like assam tribune so there i used to mostly write about you know cinema i mean i was just learning but i used to kind of try and write about uh, uh, cinema especially local cinema so okay. uh, uh, i i started uh, i mean i still remember the my first big interview was of gotam bora one of the most eminent filmmakers uh, from uh, northeast india uh, he uh, won in 1989 he had won the national award for Uh, the best first feature film uh, True. Uh, True. of a director, you know the the Indira Gandhi Award for a True. film called Osobipu, which was in a tribal language language called Karbi, and it was also shown in Berlin Film Festival that year. So uh, that uh, that for that interview, I got very good feedback from people because uh, people say that I asked the right kind of questions and uh, and. You no know, right kind of uh, you know uh, the, the the approach to doing an interview so that encouraged me a lot so uh, i it started like that but when i became a professional journalist in 93 joined uh, when i joined sentinel in guwahati so there i joined as a reporter and you know in small places uh, as a reporter you have to cover everything so from the very uh, first month i was i started covering local political parties then within 6 months i was cover, covering the state assembly uh, even sports because i was also uh, writing i want i could write on sports also mm -hmm. i covered local football tournaments even one day international which uh, happened in guwahati then uh, of course on cinema and then uh, even even uh, i remember in 94 there was a big riot uh, you know uh, uh, between two communities in the assam bhutan border so that was one of the first exposure for me for to to human misery you can say as a reporter uh, which you often access as a reporter mm -hmm. so that's how i started and uh, it it kind of uh, continued like that even in delhi uh, in pti Uh, while in PTI, I covered national elections, state elections. Similarly, in Deccan Herald, I have covered elections uh, almost in many states: in UP, in uh, you know Haryana, in Madhya Pradesh, and also I used to cover parliament proceedings, especially more more of Rajya Sabha than Lok Sabha. Mm -hmm. So, and also the some of the ministries, uh, INV Ministry, Telecom, and all that, and political parties like Congress. So that uh, gave me wide exposure to. various kind of situations like i covered the samjhota express uh, that uh, burning of samjhota express which was like a very one of the biggest you know uh, incidents in contemporary indian history mm -hmm. political history 
so uh, even uh, you know aftermath of the gujarat riots then gujarat earthquake uh, part of gujarat earthquake and uh, li likewise i used to cover everything but my heart always kind of passion always you know, when it lay in cinema writing about cinema so i used to write on that and that's how slowly i got more interested about the technical aspects of how cinema is made and all i kind of studied about it and then i switched over there so basically that's how uh, i think i think that way you know it's always i mean it has helped me you know my educational background because as a student of science you kind of uh, you start uh, analyzing everything with a scientific bent of mind so that 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 kind of i think helps even in when you are a journalist or when you are a filmmaker and also as a journalist if you have if since i have covered politics i have been to the most interior parts of india in various parts of india so uh, i have uh, had the opportunity of learning about the society you know in various from various aspect angles mm -hmm. so i think that that will help me grow as a filmmaker also because when you make films especially which subjects which are socially or socio politically relevant uh you uh, this this kind of experience will always help uh, one in you know uh understanding the nuances of a story true that true that true that no doubt uh, yeah once you are sensitive about this society uh, you know your your writing as well as cinema you know it takes a different turn all together so so my next question is basically related to the film journalism in india actually uh well there is a strong uh, school of thought you know uh, that that says that film journalism and criticism film criticism doesn't exist in india actually especially in mainstream indian media mm. they say it is mm. all paid paid journalism so what is your take take on that uh, you see film journalism is uh, uh, like you said lot of stuff is like paid journalism pr job and there are even supplements in main newspapers now which kind of where we all know that uh, paid news appears right? entertainment paid entertainment news where all the stars and uh, you know uh, they get publicity by even for frivolous doing frivolous things uh, but i think film journal I, i would not say film criticism doesn't exist in india but it it surely doesn't exist in 90% of mainline media i mean because there is no space i mean the space for serious writing about cinema or even culture or even art and literature has reduced like anything in last uh, 10 15 years so most of the serious writing if you find it will it exist in regional the, what we call regional media basically the indian languages media and also uh, all most of the serious writers about cinema they have shifted online so there are some excellent journals now online where a lot of serious writing happens and also people write lot of blogs you know so uh, now while your uh, the space in the traditional media might have reduced but there is opportunity for you to write what you feel about uh, write seriously about any art form on online you know i think uh, of course of course still there is a challenge if you want to uh, survive as a professional journalist as a professional freelance journalist writing about art culture and you know uh, cinema or literature even, even as a, even on online media i mean the problem is that of like i keep hearing uh, from my colleagues and friends many of whom have turned freelance freelancers now the challenge is getting you no know, payments from the for the published pieces mm -hmm. so i mean that challenge is there but but if you but if you keep keep writing then it, there is enough space online that i believe and i have found that a uh, lot of i mean serious writing is happening online that's why when i served as the i got the opportunity to serve as the chairman of the national award jury last year for for the best writing of cinema jury mm -hmm. so uh, i and my co jury members we gave a strong recommendation to uh, the ministry that uh, even uh, uh, writings on cinema published in recognized online media should be allowed to enter in the national award as uh, mm. as of the as as per the rules now it's only restricted to traditional print media you know you um, uh, so so that uh, i hope the government will change the rules and allow even online uh, uh, i mean from at least those published in recognized online media you know, those which are regu regularly published and which are you know recognized names uh, within the online media fraternities i think that's a that's a very well uh, thought suggestion 
and you know uh, mm. uh, after covid 19 they way the online platforms are being used you know now online platforms right. are no more the alternate you know platforms they are now mainstream basically see look yes, at the yes, education exactly. look at the education scenario in the country you know uh, so that that mm. typical classroom setup is no more the you know traditional classroom setup now now online yes, you know, yes. education platforms have become the mainstream the same way you mm-hmm. know ott platform for the film watching ott film platform for the you know film leasing it will soon be right. sort of mainstream it will never ever be a sort of you know same scenario after covid 19 right so let's say there's a right. well suggestion from your side for the uh, national film award on the best writing I, i'm sure you know it that would be taken seriously so you know now shifting focus from your journalism career to the you now film making so my first question to you is you know how do you look at the you know independent film making uh, which has much lately on uh, especially uh, in the northeast region also yeah see now i think uh, a lot of exciting work is happening across india in independent uh, you know film making uh, because of the emergence of this ott platforms there is now increasing space for these films no earlier uh, earlier also i mean we know from 1970s that that india new wave which started a lot of films used to be made but those were mostly uh, uh, confined within the festival network and at the most in earlier days when the when a film would win a national award it would be it would get telecast on doordarshan and i mean interested people would see but that access to a huge amount of potential viewership was not there i mean suppose there is a very good malayalam film so, i mean we know every year there are a number of very good malayalam films True. which get made so obviously it's all of them do not end up winning a national award and get the opportunity to get telecast on doordarshan okay and and if if those those films get telecast say on a malayalam channel then obviously people from assam or bengal or from north india won't uh, are unlikely to catch those films firstly because suppose i am an assami so i hardly would you know uh, channel surf on malayalam or tamil channels and also when you uh, telecast a film on a regional channel you usually the prints mostly the prints are without subtitles True. so those problems were there uh, but now with the coming of otts i mean I, i personally can say now i watch i get to watch all kinds of you know cinema from south from east from north i mean with subtitles and of course from across the world that goes without saying so now uh, it's a great opportunity but at the ground level i think the problems of funding for independent cinema is still there because earlier nfdc used to fund regularly but now nfdc has not been producing much for in the last few years it has it had recently given a call for production and that uh, process i hope post covid those whatever films are in the pipeline will get made but the thing is that you know that those funding issues are still there but uh, when you you were also asking about uh, you know independent cinema in northeast uh, i'm i'm really i feel proud to say that in the last 4 uh, 5 years i mean there are a lot of very very talented filmmakers who have emerged from northeast india and whose films are you know uh, traveling across the world and they are on netflix there are the they are on uh, they have gone to the biggest of the film festivals like berlin toronto mm-hmm. and uh, and they are winning prizes and they are getting acclaimed even even films uh, from notice are getting released in theaters you know outside the notice so uh, for example rima das's film uh, village rockstars was india's entry to the oscars mm-hmm. two years ago so yeah. that was that was the first time an artist and film was chosen uh, uh, as india's representative to the oscars and then there's a film like bhaskar hazarika is another very important filmmaker whose katha nodi and ami sev really right. you know made waves and those films a lot of these films are available on various ott platforms you know then there's um, hawam pavan kumar from manipur then mm-hmm. pradeep kurba and dominic sangma from meghalaya i mean there are a lot of good filmmakers who have come up in the recent years that's a very uh, good thing uh, to say but i think also it's important for you know uh, filmmakers storytellers from outside the region to also look at the region you know because what happens is that uh, like i said uh, however much uh, how, however good a film may be in a particular language uh 
in india the uh, the, the 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 realist rea realistic situation is that uh, if a film is made in hindi or tamil or malayalam it will get seen by a huge number of people because of the demographic you know um, uh, positions position of those languages yeah. so if a film is made in assamese uh, a film like amis which can be made in any language in the world and it will be as interesting as it is now but if uh, suppose amis is also made in hindi then obviously it will have a much wider market market reach within i mean uh, but now even if it's a good people a good very good film it will get restricted to a, a a limited you know audience even limited non assamese audience that's what i mean, mean to say so that those those things are there but i think uh, with the otts coming up with this alternative uh, screening mediums coming up i mean the things are changing slowly and, and i i hope and i'm sure the things will only get better with time great so you know uh, our audience would like to know about your career as a filmmaker uh, first you know why did you shift to the filmmaking from journalism uh like i said i kind of no for nearly 20 years i was a professional journalist and i have been writing about cinema i, I mean i have interviewed some of the top filmmakers from across the world uh, especially in the film festivals like ifi and uh, and and having watched a lot of cinema i thought yeah i have been all, i have also been a storyteller in a different you know form in the format of journalism and i used to regularly write features on various subjects and features are like background research work for you know documentary film making or even for fi fiction film making mm -hmm. so over the, then uh, uh, when i was like approaching uh, like around 17 18 years of my career into journalism i thought okay i have written enough about others uh, you know stories told by others so why not try to tell my own stories in my in a in in the in the film media and and, and i and having seen lot of films over the years i thought uh, you know there is still a lot, lot of opportunity and there are all stories do not fit into the journalistic mode of you know uh, writing so and and i, I and, and i cannot write fiction that is uh, i mean i fiction writing is beyond me unless i write a script you know mm -hmm. so i cannot write a novel or a story for that matter so mm -hmm. i thought i mean this is one medium i love and this is one medium which is also very accessible you know you you can watch a film uh, from any part of the world in any language and even without subtitle you will get the gist of the story to that i mean and 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 also visually it takes you transports you to a different culture a different society i mean i'm sure any any person who watches films regularly from across the world would know so much more about the world uh, than anybody else you know to that so that's how i got interested in making uh, you know films and also the fact that there are a lot of stories which are uh, which are yet untold from north east india so that was like uh, in journalism i used to write more and more and more about subjects from north east india so in filmmaking also i thought there are still a lot of stories which are uh, which can be told that's how i got interested but that doesn't mean that i will always make films only on north east india i have some subjects which are which are set in north india in in and elsewhere also hopefully i'll be able to make them in the near future uh yes. and you were asking me about my filmmaking journey so i started off with a film called the mayong meets reality which is you know mayong is a village which is just about 35 40 kilometers from guwahati it is uh, within the mayong area there is a uh, wildlife sanctuary called pobitora which is known for the world's uh, you know highest concentration of one horned rhinos so a lot of tourists go to pobitora because you can go in the morning come back in the evening and what see a lot of rhinos there uh, but uh, mayong despite being uh, so close to guwahati i mean it, people won't visit that place and they would i mean they won't stop there and because there are a lot of you know legends about the place about, about the people of the place that they they once upon a time it was a big seat of practice of magic including black magic so people would be afraid to <laughs> go there and right. uh, a lot of people visiting pobitora won't know that they have crossed mayong so mm -hmm. and i always think these these are fascinating aspects of our folk history you know these stories about magicians being able to you know to, uh, do you know unbelievable things 
and these are part of our folk literature there are folk songs and there are a lot of stories so i thought uh, it it's a good subject to explore uh, in, a, in the documentary format that's how i got into making that film and that film was in fact released uh, and in nationally uh, on dvd by jungli home video which was part of the uh, times of india group and it is still on uh, on the on youtube on their channel so it has been viewed by many people and of course if i see the film now it looks quite amateurish to me because it was my first effort if i make it again now i'll have a different approach maybe and then i made uh, this film called songs of the blue hills which is like i really feel proud about that film so it was produced by ccrt and it uh, through that i explored how uh, you know the folk music practices in nagaland are happening i mean nagaland because folk music is everywhere in the world but nagaland is a special very special case because within the nagas what what we know as nagas there are uh, many tribes within the nagas and uh, all all of them combined are called nagas but they don't understand one another's language because these are different uh, tribal communities hill communities who indigenous communities who speak different when I mean, they are from the same naga stock but their their languages are totally different mm -hmm. so uh, i i had heard that there was a kind of debate going on uh, you know within the practitioners of folk music about within the veterans and the and the new uh, new generation folk musicians that how to take this music outside to the outside world so and also there was another fact that nagaland is the only state in india where the government has set up a music task force to promote music as an industry mm -hmm. uh, so these aspects attracted me to that subject to explore so uh, when i went there and i started shooting the film and during the research also i found that it's uh, really fascinating things are happening in nagaland as far as music goes you know i mean uh, nagaland has been a very disturbed society for many many decades from uh, even from pre independence times because there was an insurgency and which is uh, even now talks are going on with government of india for resolution of the issues but uh, they are culturally very passionate they are very proud they are a very proud community about their own culture language and music and and like one of the interview interviewees in my film they uh, says that uh, that without music there is no naga and without mm. na i mean nagaland cannot exist without music so that film uh, actually uh, also taught me many things uh, about how important music can be to a society and also how the kind of experiments they are doing with their folk music without diluting its essence so i think there are lots of lessons to be learned learned for other states from uh, nagaland and i in my film i was it, it was quite well received everywhere it was screened it has been screened in around 20 film festivals across the world too including in ifi and also part of the uh, world music course in central conservatory music in beijing which is china's biggest you know musical conservatory Right. So uh, that was one very and another another film I made, which is my last uh, completed documentary, which is yet to be released. It's called the Memories of a Forgotten War. It is it it kind of I started you know uh, in the Second World War uh, in during the Second World War, the Japanese had, had come up to Kohima. The, we know the famous Battle of Kohima, uh, which was which is in Britain. It, it for the British Army it was declared as the, one of the most important battles the British Army ever fought. yeah so uh, but i thought you know there are a lot of uh, memories about those uh, i mean there have been documentaries on battle of kohima from bbc channel 4 and some other you know but those are only from the point of view of how the battles were fought and who won and who lost okay but i thought there are other aspects also to there are very some very personal and human stories are always involved in uh, in when there is a human tragedy you know be it war or being be with the current covid situation mm -hmm. so uh, i started off like i one of my friends uh, who was my junior in college in guwahati in cotton college subhimal bhattacharji so i was discussing with him that this is a subject which kind of we need to kind of record document this uh, the people who witnessed the wars in the battles in manipur and nagaland you know who are very old now because they were the eye witnesses to the events unfolding in their you know backyards 
and those stories would be gone after a few years because those people are getting old so he said yeah let's uh, let's let's and he's also very passionate about uh, you know our region because he also comes from there so that's how the whole idea started and we started we uh, went to first went to manipur and incidentally 2014 was the 70th anniversary of the battle of kohima and battle of imphal so i happened to meet uh, people from you know from there was a group from england which had come uh, with a, with with one war veteran and also uh, some children of war veteran mm -hmm. so that triggered another idea and uh, uh, fortunately my producer subimal was very supportive of that that we should if possible uh, because documentary filmmaking as we know in india is 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 not financially viable you know you make a film documentary film only when a government is agency Uh, commissions you or or somebody is too much passionate about that subject to get a film made mm -hmm. so uh, so we uh, we both discussed that let's try if possible if financially we can do it let's try and interview a couple of veterans from both sides from japan and you know england mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, that's how we ended up going to both the countries we documented the uh, 70th anniversary uh commemorations in both the countries and also we got the opportunity to interview some of the veterans and some of them are no more unfortunately now because when i interviewed them in 2014 uh, around that time uh, the youngest one was 91 years old the oldest was 96 years old mm -hmm. so and they had fascinating stories about how they had survived those battles i mean and the most emotional moment was when i had one japanese veteran and one british veteran sitting together in tokyo and discussing about <laughs> about fighting each other i mean they had not fought each other uh, directly face to face because they were placed in different uh, you know uh, parts of the region but they had faced each other's army and it was such an emotional moment i mean even the film it comes off very strongly so i think that was basically my idea was to kind of uh, narrate the personal uh, memories of those people you know and and also record those personal histories because uh, these personal histories are nobody documents these personal histories no usually uh, people look at the larger picture so that's how i ended up making that film from the point of view of telling this i mean recording these personal memories of people who fought in the battle as well as people who witnessed those battles and there are fascinating stories i mean i have almost 40 hours of interviews with uh, veterans and the uh, eyewitnesses i could use only a few of them in the film but uh, there are there are absolutely wonderful stories yeah. and then this film was very well received you know all across the world uh, yeah i yeah. and and you know uh, when i look at your films you know most of your uh, subjects are from the northeast region only so i have two questions on that you yeah, know yeah. first uh, what was it difficult to make films in northeast region uh, the kind of issues and challenges uh, you face you know making your films in the region uh, those those might be financial regions also and my second question is you know uh, you you take your subject from the northeast northeast region only so is there any deliberate thought on it or are you going to sort of take subject from elsewhere as well yeah uh, i mean of course uh, challenges uh, of taking up subjects from any region is i mean i feel it's almost the same because you have to do the same amount of research and you have to do the story since uh, tell the story sincerely and from an objective point of view as far as possible uh, of course I'm, i mean if you strongly believe in a subject you cannot be objective you always become subjective and that's where your point of view comes in as a storyteller but okay. uh, then uh, since i come from northeast and i have a lot of friends across the region both having worked as a journalist and also as a filmmaker so i i have good access to all parts of northeast as a filmmaker so i i don't face any problems as such i mean in terms of going into the interiors or you know finding accommodation for for that matter and and uh, as as filmmakers like as journalists we we can adjust anywhere you know we can stay in an, under an open sky also if required so so that's one thing and secondly you know uh, like i said earlier like uh, you know making uh, uh, films on subjects from northeast i mean it's 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 part of my you know passion because i i want to tell more and more untold stories from northeast and if you see 
my films and my all the documentaries I have made and the one single feature film I have made, they are subjects which have not been handled uh, before as such. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, and also I, I even if a film subject has been dealt with earlier, maybe I, I try to, uh, uh, you know, tell the story from a more universal point of view, you know, so so that's how uh, but but that doesn't mean i will like i said i i i it's, it's it's i have several subjects which are set in other parts of india in, in including in bengal in delhi in in rural north, north india so so i as a, as a filmmaker and a storyteller i am i i am ready to tell stories from any part of the world but only uh, thing is that that story has to kind of personally appeal to me and personally appeal to my uh, you know believe my thought process as a as a storyteller Adi, very well said yeah uh, the, the filmmakers you know they, they need to sort of you know discuss the subject which are around them and which will yeah. make a, which, which make a subject great you know that's why you know the, the films from the you know, different part of the world especially from the europe you know these guys they are they are making you know films which are very much rooted to their culture, actually. So right, that's exactly. they are getting the original content, you know, from them, and they are being appreciated world over. So I think with this question, right. we have come to the end of the show. Now we can take questions of the audience. Uh, we have some questions ready uh, from the audience now. Uh, right. Mr. Obadullah Rehan, we asked, you know, how you see science filmmaking in India? So what initiatives should be made to join the students in this direction? Okay, yeah, science filmmaking is, you know, very, I mean, if you see uh, only a few organizations, government organizations regularly, uh, you know, get the science, science films made. Uh, uh, I mean, I myself being a science student, I have certain subjects uh, uh, of, of a science background, which, which I want to make into films, I mean, both in fiction and non-fiction, but hopefully I'll be able to make them in future. But uh, Science filmmaking is quite limited in India. I mean, I uh, I served as uh, as a jury member a couple of years ago in the National Science Film Festival, mm -hmm. and I found that I mean there are a lot of student projects uh, which which get made by schools and colleges. Uh, I mean, because now many colleges have their mass com department or you know mass media department, filmmaking department, mm -hmm. and a lot of these film clubs are there in many schools and colleges now where people watch films and they kind of now because of the digital uh, filmmaking facilities it's it's easier to make a film with a cheaper cost so there are a lot of student filmmaking uh, happening in, in the science arena and also some institutional filmmaking supported by government institutions but generally you know we independent science filmmaking is not uh, that genre is not very strong in india like if you see in Europe or uh, North America or even Latin America, there are a lot of films which are made on agriculture, made on you know genetic, uh, you know GM pro uh, agriculture, and uh, there are a lot of films made on environment, uh, supported by various independent organizations. That thing is, uh, I mean, in India, I think organizations, even in, uh, uh, the private organizations or trusts which support documentary filmmaking, they are more inclined towards social and sociopolitical or at the most cultural subjects. Uh, so I think a lot of lot can be, a lot more can be done uh, in towards making films on, you know, subjects which relate to science. True that. I think this question is well answered, Ubaid. Uh, so Ubaid has one more question. He says, many region cinema is still not accessible to all general public. OTT platforms have done some great work to yeah. bring regional cinema to the people. What more should be done to popularize the regional cinema of India? Okay, I think, yeah, like you said, OTT platforms have really opened up the world for uh, regional cinema. I actually personally don't like the term regional cinema. It kind of uh, yeah. makes it sound <laughs> inferior. Inferior. I, 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 I prefer to call it Indian language cinema, Indian languages cinema or something like that, or cinemas of India. You know, because regional that connotation is always kind of, kind of it's I, I it's kind of inferior to me. I mean, of course, I mean it's a term everybody uses for the lack of a better term. 
uh, but yes uh, this uh, cinema from various parts of india now much more visible because of the ott platforms and uh, that's a very good thing to happen and also there are a lot of ott platforms which are uh, region specific like there is sun next from south and there's hoi choi from bengal where they give only uh, content only from their regions in their languages so that is uh, also people from other regions can also explore uh, those apps you know the, those ott platforms because a lot of content comes with almost all content comes with you know subtitles so that's a great window but uh, again for uh, languages which are smaller in terms of number of people speaking them for them it's not very easy to come up with an ott platform by on their own you know for example uh, for a manipuri ott platform or an assamese manipuri uh, ott platform would be very difficult to uh, you know uh, sustain economically so uh, these uh, so there there are there is definitely a need for more exposure to cinemas like that on ott platforms but because also what is happening in ott on ott platforms is that they are uh, while they are aggregating lot of content they are also kind of going for more popular names you know yeah. either the film has to be kind of uh, well traveled in festivals or it has to star a big uh, star some recognizable names or directed by recognizable names again so there are a lot of young filmmakers who are coming up with uh, you know excellent work and those they they find it very difficult to you know uh, go on ott platforms so that is a diff problem area but it is still evolving and with now the whole mode of uh, taking content to people changing because of covid 19 i think things will drastically change in the coming times to that I'm sure, Ubaid, you you got the answer of your question. Uh, so we have the last question of the show today. Uh, it is from Mr. Saurabh Bhuyal. He says, "Hi, sir. How do you rope in technicians and people uh, of you know those sound, light, camera editing, etc. for different tasks? So do you have a fixed crew, or you hire technicians based on the variables or available budget? Please tell us about the crew team you work with." okay yeah that's a very important question actually important. see the crew yeah the crew always depends i mean of course the budget is one very important aspect because even if you want to suppose hire a very famous dop uh, director of photography for your film you might not be able to afford him or her you know because uh, the fees might be very high but sometimes lot of big names also work at a much reduced fees if the subject you know kind of inspires them or excites them so that is one aspect but usually i think all filmmakers including me uh, we kind of uh, try to have a crew which we are comfortable with uh, creatively as well as personally you know now sometimes you work with a team and then you develop a kind of rapport or the team also understands what you are uh, the way you work you uh, the way you want to work so that's how i think if you see most of the filmmakers they Uh, usually have a, have crew which is like almost like at least eighty percent of them are permanent around them. Uh, only if somebody is not available, they look for a second option. True. So I think that is that also is true for me. I mean, I have only made one feature film, and the team I have worked with was excellent. Uh, the production team and the crew, technical crew, uh, they were all from Assam, and so i mean those were also some of them were like my i had known them for years and years even when they had started out in their careers and now they have become very famous so they were very uh, gracious to uh, you know help me out in making my first feature film and in documentaries also i kind of work with uh, a, a team team of people who i i have known for, known already and they also understand the kind of Uh, uh style i follow in making my films but that doesn't mean that i don't look to look forward to working with you know newer people because you know always certain subjects demand certain kind of attitudes you know uh, like uh, the suppose the cinematographer of one of my cultural films may not be able to uh, uh, kind of understand uh, the nuances of a film with a science subject which is based on science you know if i'm talking about say documentaries so so i mean there are strong points uh, and weak points of every technical person so 
if i can leverage that to my advantage i mean that's what i think a filmmaker looks forward to and i was very fortunate that my feature film issue was actually edited by as rikar prasad who is one of the legends of editing in indian cinema True and that. he uh, yeah he kind of uh, i have known him for years and years as a friend but is a most humble person i have come across in my life one of the most humble humblest persons and the person who edits all the mani ratnam films lots of vishal bharadwaj films and lots of big big films from across languages seven times national award winner i mean i just called him up and requested if you can edit my first feature film so he just said yes i i told him up front that i cannot pay your what fee whatever fees you usually charge he said that that don't discuss that with me <laughs> i mean it's like that then i my sound design was done by amrit pritam datta who is who is a, one of the voting members of the academy awards and national award winner and ampas award winner from us i mean he was one of, he is an associate of rasul pokutti and so that way uh, i was very fortunate and lucky to have some of the best technicians you know working in my project do that i think saurabh your question is uh, well answered so before we close you know this show today i have you know uh, one small request from you if you could share you know some tips to the you know youngsters who want to enter into the profession of film critic or maybe as uh, for the indie film making also you know what they should have you know what they should attempt in the beginning so that you know they can make their career in you know film critic or maybe for the indie film making as well right right see uh, when i started as a film critic uh, i mean there was hardly any guidance there was no digital media to get access to uh, you know lot of stuff and similarly with cinema we used to get access to cinema only at the film festivals i mean so you have to wait for the whole year for the film festival to happen and especially of course in delhi you get if you want you can watch a world cinema world film every evening at one of the cultural centers or Uh, you know uh, or like in iic or india habitat center that advantage is there but that is not there for people in all the towns and cities True. okay so so in our time only that either you go to film festivals or then later on in later years we got access to you know video cassettes but that was again hardly any access to world cinema it like mostly hindi and hollywood cinema True. so i think now uh, people who want to get into Uh, film criticism or film making it's it's times are to- totally different and very very good in fact because if you want to go uh, become a film critic critic first of all watch lot of cinema all kinds of cinema when i would say the good the bad and the ugly everything i mean from the trashiest cigarette cinema to the classics of world cinema of course of course one needs to watch watch good films more i mean if you watch 80% bad films then you won't become a film critic so and so but you need to understand what is bad also so you need to watch all kinds of cinema and watch all kinds mean all kinds it's not only fiction you watch documentaries one short films what experimental films everything and and you lot of good resources are there online you know to for film film critics and filmmakers both so uh, i mean it's it's i mean internet is really a boon for today's generation if you want to know how to use it positively and uh, similarly film making with mobile phones people are making wonderful short films even fi- fi- feature films are getting made on mobiles that i think i'm sure a lot of us know but at the same time it's easy to make a film uh, on a mobile phone and edit it yourself and you know if you want to go into film making try Uh, making films with your friends with very uh, small easy to make subjects which and you will you will understand whether you have a knack in you to tell a story and also you also you will learn the techniques you know i mean there are a lot of uh, self help guides guides on in available on internet both in written and video format so mm-hmm. one can kind of watch that and so lot, basically you have to try and and, and also there are for in, one uh, filmmakers or script writers who want to go into the profession there are a lot of screen writing workshops that happen of course some of them are costly but there are a lot of free stuff also and also a lot of screen writing workshops where you can send your script if if you get selected you get really good guidance and maybe your script will get picked up by some filmmaker good filmmaker also so well, uh, that's how i think one should approach
True. I think you're very well put up, uh, Utpalji. And it's been such a such an honor and privilege to have you on the show. You know, you shared your fascinating journey of you know film critic, film journalist as a film journalist as a filmmaker also. Uh, it's been wonderful talking to you today. You know, I'm I'm sure our audience uh, would have benefited from your uh, talk today. I think we have just received one more question from Saurabh Goel. He is asking, uh, have you tried raising yeah. funds through international film funds or through crowdfunding platforms? Or raise funds through Indian funding, uh, Indian funding organization. If so, how do the how do to differ? Which one do you suggest? See, crowdfunding is. I mean, it's people. Uh, people have tried crowdfunding uh, in India. There have been quite a few films which have been made through crowdfunding. But I think, personally speaking, you know, in in a country like India, uh, if we do crowdfunding. For uh, you know, for setting up a school in a remote area or setting up a hospital in a remote area, that is more required. I mean, more than filmmaking. But uh, mm -hmm. of course, if somebody wants to support a good film, uh, I mean, no problem with that. Even I would welcome such help from any anybody. But that uh, I mean, uh, personally, that's my belief that you one has to be. Uh, those are. More, I mean, during the current scenario, it has become even more apparent that we need much better healthcare facilities, much more uh, better local infrastructure for people not to migrate out of their homes to another distant place in search of livelihood. So there are a lot of issues, uh, but it's it's a kind of uh, welcome also in that way that if somebody wants to support a good idea for a film, uh, it's welcome. But international. Uh, funding platforms those are i think more uh, they're of course hugely competitive because filmmakers from all over the world apply for them and there are only a limited number of fundings available but they are also very very uh, you know uh, professional in terms of how the whole process goes through so if you get an international funding uh, for your film then uh, then it will you will you, you can be sure that this that film will get marketed in various regions of the world because that funding agency itself will uh, see to it that they also create that infrastructure for your film and and of course your and and getting selected to an international funding platform means that your content the story you want to tell is very important globally because only then somebody from sitting in europe or uh, you know japan we would find a story set in Chhattisgarh, you know. So True that's that. how I look at these things. Yeah. True that. So have you ever tried, you know, raising fund uh, through an international forum or crowdfunding? Uh, not crowdfunding. International. I have submitted my scripts uh, to a few script, uh, you know, workshops and all, but uh, uh, it got selected in one, then it got uh, it went up to a certain level in another, and then then it didn't proceed further. Mm -hmm. But that's all right. But I, I have I have certain subjects for which I will like I plan to approach international funding agencies. But for to approach international funding agencies, the requirement in most of these funding agencies is that you need to have an in Indian producer attached. Mm -hmm. I mean, so so that's that's one thing uh, that is always required. So uh, okay. in fact, currently I am developing a script which is which I I'll try to find an Indian producer and then go for international funding, hopefully. True that. Um, Saurav, I'm sure this question is well answered. Uh, we have last comment from Mr. Rajit Rai. He says, welcome, Utpal Bhur Pujari ji. You are a genuine film journalist and now a filmmaker. So thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so with this, with this uh, we sort of close the show here only because we already crossed you know, one hour now. So I'm right, sure. Right. This show has been enjoyed by all the viewers and, and thank you so much Upalji, for joining us today. It's been you know such a yeah. honor to have you on the show today. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Actually, it was I, I didn't realize that one hour had passed so fast. So it was just really <laughs> a great talk. And I am I I am I'm really thankful to you for you know you know kind of conducting it in a very smooth way and, and some really nice questions from the audience also. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you so much. It's been, it's been fascinating journey you shared today. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, dear you, viewers, uh, uh, tomorrow at the same time at 11:30 a.m. we'll be, you know, with you again with, with another personality. So please uh, keep watching our FB page for the, you know, uh, details of the, you know, rest of the personalities who will be joining us in the near future. 
So till then, goodbye, good day, stay safe. Thank you so much.